Thank you, Nick. What a handsome looking crowd we have here. So I think first and foremost, I'd like to um, extend our welcome to you this evening uh, for our first program of the Global Economy Series. Zurich is really pleased and delighted to be a part of this. Um, we find um, supporting this to be a very um, important part of our own brand initiative. Uh, and we will be supporting next week's event on the 9th as well. Our organization together with the council recognize the need to lead these discussions on the increased opportunities, the increased severity, the increased uh, uh, frequency, as well as the amplification of risk throughout the world economy. Zurich Insurance is a global leader managing risk with more than a century of experience in North America. Actually, we had our one year anniversary in 2012. Uh, we help companies manage and understand their risk. And of course, we know it's in a very rapidly changing, interconnected world. While addressing those issues requires a multi-stakeholder response, Zurich and the Council play a role in highlighting, I think, these pressure points. Last fall, we were delighted to host India's Central Bank Chief, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, and the Financial Times' Martin Wolf. Tonight, we are delighted to host renowned Berkeley, and I just learned Cambridge on sabbatical, uh, economist Barry Eichengreen for a discussion on the Great Depression, the Great Recession, and the uses and misuses of history. Memories of the Great Depression have haunted economists, or we might learn otherwise, more than three quarters of a century. When the Great Recession and the financial crisis once again brought the, or the Great Recession, and the financial crisis once again brought the economy to a brink in 2008, our policymakers, economists, instinctively turned to lessons learned from the 1930s to craft our response. In 2008, the interconnectedness of our financial system was exposed. And we had actually just a real brief conversation in the back of the room that maybe we're not any more interconnected today than we were in the 30s, but I think that's going to be um, exciting about this discussion. In the seven years that have passed since the start of the global financial crisis, governments, financial institutions, customers, and businesses have taken a variety of steps to account for the risk interconnectivity. What remains is that all business, large and small, face risk regardless of the size of the scope of their operations. From an insurance perspective, policy should support our ability to diversify risk. When capital is trapped and the cost for consumers is driven upwards, when by constraining the ability of internationally active insurance groups to effectively diversify clients' risk and allocate capital, customers and global markets face higher barriers to optimally managing their risk. In simple terms, we find that the law of large numbers does work. Stability actually does flow from rigorous management of diversified portfolios of uncorrelated risk. While governments globally were able to avoid many of the worst excesses of the 1930s, the recovery, you might say, has perhaps been unnecessarily long and unnecessarily painful. Did policymakers learn the correct lessons from the Great Depression? And in light of globalization and the integration of markets since the 1930s, how relevant is that era to understanding, to the understanding of today's global economy? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty uh, excited about hearing Professor Eichengreen's perspectives on these issues. Quite complex indeed. But let's start with introducing him and hearing his perspective on these issues. Professor Barry Eichengreen is the George C. Pardee and the Helen N. Pardee Professor of Economics and a Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley, where he has taught since 1987. He is also a Research Associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a Research Fellow of the Center for Economic Policy and Research. He's a regular columnist for Project Syndicate and has authored several books. Previously, he was a senior policy advisor at the International Monetary Fund, and I just learned again that he's also in the UK at the moment at Cambridge. So please join me in welcoming Professor Barry Eichengreen. Thank you. 
Sabrina Hart, thank you very much for the, uh, the kind introduction and thank you to both um, Zurich and the Chicago Council. Uh, it's nice uh, that the two of you are hosting me tonight. I will not read anything into the fact that you chose April 1st <laughs> as the date for this event. I notice also that you have me sandwiched between Angel Ubide, who's an expert on the Euro crisis, a third of my book is about the Euro, and Mervyn King, uh, who is coming to speak about the global financial crisis. So what I have working in my favor is I know absolutely nothing about counterfeiting. <laughs> so I, I have a sense, uh, I believe, of what at least some people in this audience are thinking. Oh no, not another, not another lecture, not another book on the financial crisis. There have been a few over the last seven or eight years, and, and, and there will be more. So I do feel uh, uh, obliged to start with a bit of a defense. Um, why, why, why did I feel obliged to write another book on, on the financial crisis? Part of the answer is that I think with the passage of time, it becomes possible to view the financial crisis as history. So when I think back to the events of 2008, I am engulfed by an overwhelming sense of panic that things were happening very quickly, things that we had never seen before in our lifetimes. And it was very hard to make sense of them, in part because we couldn't begin yet to understand how our crisis fit into the larger historical narrative. Maybe now, with the passage of time, uh, uh, we have enough context to begin to do that. Secondly, I, I, I think economists uh, have an obligation to engage in some introspection about why the profession didn't do a better job of anticipating the crisis and why we didn't do a still better job than we did at, at responding to it. And, and my book is in part my own effort to in, in, in engage in that kind of uh, evaluation. And third and finally, with the passage of time, I think it's possible to laugh as well as cry about some of the events through which we, we lived. So I do deploy my somewhat um, ghoulish sense of humor at various points uh, in the book. Why? Hall of Mirrors, uh, the Great Depression, the Great Recession, and the uses and misuses of history. I wish I could claim that I an, an anticipated the conflict between um, Athens and Berlin over debt and debt forgiveness. Uh, there was that earlier Hall of Mirrors in Versailles where in 1919 Germany was saddled with an enormously heavy debt burden uh, uh, a decision that gave rise to a series of uh, disastrous economic, financial, and political consequences, a debt burden of which it was then relieved at the London Debt Conference in 1933. But the reality is that, that I was attracted to this metaphor, Hall of Mirrors, because for, for me it symbolized the recipro reciprocal relationship between the Great Depression of the 1930s and the Great Recession of 2008-2009. Uh, uh, it, it is a book about how the experience of the Great Depression shaped and informed our collective response to the Great Recession of 2008-2009. And it's how having lived through that near financial death experience now how the experience of the Great Recession will change how we think and write and some of us teach uh, the history of the Great Depression. It's about why, um, as Sabrina said, why recovery from the Great Recession hasn't been more complete and successful. It's about why post-crisis reform hasn't been more ambitious and far-reaching and it's about how we got into this mess in the first place. So let me start with um, the point about 
history, the point being that history is a lens through which, I'm, through which we, by which I mean uh, both the informed public and our uh, elected and, and appointed officials, view current problems. Indeed, I would argue that, that the um, influence of history, the, the role of uh, historical analogy in decision-making is never more compelling dur than during crises. Crises, after all, are when there is no time for careful analytical reasoning. Crises are when there is no time for the kind of formal model building uh, that economists like to engage in. Crises are when there is no time for testing the fitness of one's preferred model uh, against the data. So crises are, are when policymakers respond to uh, 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 rely on historical analogies, um, facile or otherwise. This is a point that foreign policy specialists have, have long made. They refer to the influence of the Munich analogy in, for example, shaping President Truman's decision to intervene uh, in Korea in 1950. So it was, uh, I would argue, with uh, the Great Recession of 2008-2009 and the Great Depression of 1929-1933, the two great economic and financial crises of the last century, there is absolutely no doubt that conventional wisdom uh, about that earlier episode, what are referred to colloquially as the lessons of the Great Depression, powerfully shaped the response to the crisis uh, of 2008-2009. In particular, uh, the decisions uh, of policymakers this time were powerfully shaped and informed by received wisdom about the mistakes of their predecessors. Uh, in the 1930s, when, when that earlier crisis hit, those predecessors had succumbed to the protectionist temptation to uh, throw up barriers against uh, imports uh, and exports. They had cut public spending at the worst possible time, at the same time private spending was collapsing. They had failed to stabilize the money supply. They had neglected their responsibility for financial stability. They had uh, failed to provide uh, emergency assistance to, to the banks. So the result in the 1930s was collapsing banks, collapsing money supplies, collapsing prices, collapsing trade, collapsing economic activity. In a word, in a phrase, the great macroeconomic catastrophe uh, of modern times. So this became conventional wisdom, courtesy of influential scholars like Milton Friedman, known, known to this audience, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's Monetary History of the United States, without question the single most influential work in economic and financial history written in the 20th century. So people like Ben Bernanke and Christina Romer and I hazard to guess Hank Paulson and Mervyn King were, had read or were, were aware of this book and the lessons it was known to convey. So in 2008, heeding, the, heeding those lessons, policymakers vowed to do better. If the failure of their predecessors in the 1930s to provide emergency liquidity had produced a cataclysmic banking and financial crisis, then this time instead they would flood financial markets with liquidity. If failure to stabilize the money supply and expand central bank balance sheets in the 1930s had resulted in a disastrous deflation, then this time they would cut interest rates to zero and, and pursue other uh, countercyclical monetary policies. Uh, uh, if uh, efforts to balance budgets had worsened the earlier slump, then this time instead they would provide, they, they would apply fiscal stimulus. And as a result of that very different policy response, unemployment in the United States peaked at only 10%. So 10% is unacceptable, 10% is painfully high, 
but 10% is much lower than the 25% unemployment rate that the U.S. suffered in 1933. This time, failed banks numbered only in the hundreds, not in the thousands, as was the case in the 1930s. Financial dislocations were widespread, but the complete and utter collapse of U.S. financial markets, as occurred in the 30s, was successfully averted. And what was true of the United States was true of other countries. So I um, write in the book, every, every unhappy country is unhappy in its own way. And there were varying degrees of economic unhappiness after uh, 2008, but a few ill-starred Southern European countries notwithstanding, uh, that degree of unhappiness did not rise to, uh, to 1930s levels because policy was better this time, the decline in output uh, and employment, the social dislocations, the human pain and suffering were all less. That then is the happy narrative, which clearly is a bit too happy. Uh, for one thing, it's hard to square, as I alluded to before, um, with our collective failure to anticipate the risks. So this is a point that Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II famously made to the assembled economists on her visit to the London School of Economics in 2008. Why didn't you see it coming, she asked the economists uh, at the time. In response, some months later, a group of those economists wrote the Queen a letter and they claimed that they or some of their colleagues had seen it coming. But I think if you look at what the economists in question, even some of the most far-sighted ones, um, had been saying, they had in fact been warning uh, of a different crisis than the one that in fact happened. They'd been warning of a dollar crash uh, reflecting the problem of global imbalances rather than the subprime crisis that we in fact experienced, or they'd simply been issuing the kind of vague and nonspecific warnings that economists are, are such economists are inclined <laughs> to issue. So that's my own mea culpa. Uh, I'm, I'm a specialist on financial crises. I'm supposed to be a, a specialist on, on the history of financial crises, and I didn't exactly see uh, it coming. Introspection suggests to me that uh, our collective failure reflects what psychologists refer to as continuity bias, the subconscious tendency to think that the future will tend to resemble the uh, immediate past. It reflects peer pressure to conform, which, um, did you tell me this was on or off the record? I, I would, would acknowledge uh, does exist in the academy as well as elsewhere, and the costs of being ostracized if, for example, you, are, you were rec reckless enough to criticize Alan Greenspan's financial stewardship at the Fed's Jackson Hole Conference in uh, 2005, and it, it reflects the uh, influence of big financial institutions through their political contributions and, and other channels in shaping the, the policy debate. All that said, I would argue that the roots of our uh, failure to see the recent uh, crisis coming lay ultimately in the same progressive narrative of the Great Depression that I described to you before. So recall that narrative. It went entirely correctable flaws of, of, of collective decision making had been responsible for the inability of contemporaries in the 1920s to see their crisis coming and to respond to it uh, adequately. Modern day policymakers had learned from the mistakes of their predecessors. We now had scientific central banking informed by a rigorous framework called inflation targeting to reduce uh, um, financial volatility and, and serious imbalances. We had advances in supervision and regulation to limit financial excesses. We had deposit insurance to prevent the kind of depositor runs and panics 
memorialized in It's a Wonderful Life. Um, conventional wisdom about the Great Depression that it had been caused by entirely avoidable policy failures was itself conducive to the belief that those failures could be and indeed had been corrected. It followed that no comparable crisis was possible now. All of which we of course know was dreadfully wrong. Part of the problem I think is that we, in this case I mean we economic historians, this is my, my second mea culpa, if you will, had always done a better job of explaining the course of the Great Depression, how it became great once it was underway, than why it began to unfold uh, in, in the first place. So I'm about to give you a series of, of observations about the 1920s, but as I go, if you would like to substitute the 10 years leading up to our financial crisis, I think all the same points carry over. We've, we had failed to highlight how in the 1920s, rapid financial innovation had combined with inadequate regulation and lax monetary policy to encourage dangerous financial fragilities. We had, had failed to explain how in the 1920s, capital flows to one half of Europe from the other half of Europe and the rest of the world set that continent up for a, a, a painful fall. We had failed to explain how in the 1920s a long period of stability, a long period of stability that people explained uh, by referring to the advent of scientific central banking, the creation of the Fed in 1914, encouraged uh, um, uh, excessive, uh, a, a belief that the business cycle had been tamed, tamed which encouraged, in, in, in turn, encouraged additional uh, risk taking. Recent experience suggests the need to write that 1920s history more carefully and I think if some of us had done so earlier we might have seen uh, more clearly how the same factors were at work in the early 21st century. I would argue moreover that uh, the fateful decision to um, let Lehman Brothers fail in September of 2008, what was, uh, with benefit of hindsight, the single biggest mistake of the financial crisis also suggests looking at the 1920s differently. So Lehman failed because it was insolvent, because its managers had taken bad bets. Lehman failed because the Fed and the Treasury were uncertain about whether they had the legal authority uh, to rescue it. But Lehman also failed because policymakers wanted to make a statement. Uh, they had been raked over the coals for rescuing another important investment bank, Bear Stearns, six months uh, earlier, and they were anxious to signal uh, to the Congress, among others, that not everyone would be rescued. Uh, as a result of our having lived through that experience, I think, uh, future historians will have to write uh, the history of the Great Depression differently. They will be reminded that um, the great banking crisis of 1933, the third great banking crisis of the Great Depression, which forced FDR as his very first act on taking office on March 4th, 1933, to close down the whole U.S. Ba banking and financial system. Uh, and effectively the economy for uh, two weeks. Those events reflected a, a, a series of factors, but among them was the decision in, in, in January of 1933 not to bail out a, a, a set of big banks in, in, in Michigan, the Guardian Group. The Guardian Group was, of course, Henry Ford's family bank, Edsel Ford's family bank, to be precise. Why wasn't it bailed out? Uh, the, again, the story is complicated, but a simple answer is that the Hoover administration and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation had taken the difficult decision to bail out another important uh, bank, uh, Chicago Bank, Central Republic Trust, about six months earlier. If you recall your Chicago history, you will know that Central Republic was 
the Dawes Bank. It was the Dawes Family Bank. It was the bank controlled by the family of former U.S. Vice President. Even worse, uh, until a week earlier, head of the self-same Reconstruction Finance Corporation, Charles Dawes. So that the difficult decision to uh, bail out Central Republic was taken in the summer of 1932. The Congress was outraged. It tightened up uh, uh, the rules for the RFC. And there was a whole lot of political flack as a result. That, I think, played directly into the decision to let um, the Guardian Group go under six months later in the same way that the political backlash played into the, the Lehman decision. I think there was also a failure to anticipate or recognize how disruptive the collapse of Lehman Brothers would be. And here, too, I would blame the so-called lessons uh, of the Great Depression. The conventional narrative about the Great Depression, which we all learned from great scholars like Friedman and Schwartz, was that it was all about the, the commercial banks. It was all about the disruptive impact uh, on the economy, the, the negative impact on the money supply, the negative impact on confidence of commercial bank failures uh, and runs by retail depositors. Lehman was not uh, a commercial bank. Lehman was not a deposit-taking institution. Lehman didn't have retail depositors. So if you took that narrative literally, too literally, we would say, with benefit of hindsight, it followed that Lehman's failure couldn't pose such serious problems. I would argue that this view, informed by the so-called lessons of the Great Depression, was why the, the, uh, the Basel Accord setting capital adequacy standards for internationally active financial institutions focused on commercial banks. Deposit insurance focused on commercial banks. Regulation generally before the crisis focused on commercial banks, a focus that neglected the shadow banking system of investment banks, hedge funds, money market funds, commercial paper, issuers, securitizers, until it was too late. A problem that Stanley Fisher on the Board of Governors reminded us of, it was either late last week or early this. Um, that neglect ignored Lehman's derivatives positions. It ignored the fact that wholesale creditors, other financial institutions, could effectively run on the bank, and the result was, uh, as I asserted before, uh, the decision to allow the uncontrolled failure of Lehman, the single most serious mistake of the financial crisis. So it was at this point, after Lehman Brothers, that policymakers realized they had a situation on their hands, that we really were on the verge of another Great Depression, and they responded uh, aggressively. The leaders of the advanced countries uh, uh, quickly issued a joint statement that no additional systemically important financial institution would be allowed to fail. AIG was bailed out. Uh, a reluctant Congress passed the TARP on a second try, one after another. Governments took steps to provide uh, liquidity and in, in, inject capital into distressed financial institutions. Uh, there was the o Obama stimulus. There was the Gordon Brown chaired meeting of the group of 20 countries in London in early 2009, where governments committed to an additional trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus. So policymakers could congratulate themselves, tri triumphantly congratulate themselves that they had succeeded in uh, avoiding another Great Depression. Yet, I would argue that these policy initiatives, the results of these policy initiatives were decidedly less than triumphal. You will know that recovery in the United States has been lethargic by historical standards. So we may or may not be approaching full employment now. That's a discussion for uh, a, a, another evening and another 
event, but it sure has taken us a long time to get to this point. And what is true of the United States is, is true of, of a variety of other countries. Where I live in the UK, recovery has similarly proceeded at only half the pace typical uh, of an expansion. And you will know that Europe has done even worse, uh, experiencing uh, five years of crisis now and not a single dip, but a double dip recession. So this was not the successful stabilization and vigorous recovery promised us by those who had learned the lessons of history. So we can have a long discussion about why not. My, my view, and maybe in the, in, in the interest of time, I will short circuit it a little bit. We can talk more about it in the Q&A, is that I, I, I don't think policymakers in the United States, in Europe, in a variety of countries, did as much as they could have or should have to support a more vigorous recovery, that there was the need for continued stimulus spending in a period when the private sector was deleveraging. There was uh, a reluctance on the part of central banks to do more and a desire to return to normal policies before we had yet returned to uh, a normal uh, economy. So I, I'm not disputing the fact that there were some uh, economies like Greece where a considerable dose of fiscal austerity was required, I would observe that the, the dosage level in the case of Greece is unprecedented in the history of, uh, uh, of the modern world so far as I can tell. So I remind you, uh, Greece has in three short years cut government spending and raised taxes by fully 17% cumulative of national income. One out of every seven euros of spending in the Greek economy has been vaporized, and it's hard to see how increased domestic investment or exports could have easily substituted for those policies. And now we are seeing the difficult political consequences to which the resulting uh, recession uh, gives rise. The striking thing is that even economies with fiscal space, even economies like the one in which I uh, am grateful to reside this year, the United Kingdom, uh, which has the flexibility afforded by its own national currency and its own national central bank, embarked on a, a, an ambitious program of fiscal consolidation, cutting public spending and raising taxes by a cumulative 5% of GDP. Um, central banks, for their part, having taken a variety of exceptional steps in, in the crisis, have similarly been anxious to return to uh, business uh, a, 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 as usual. Um, I am somewhat critical in the book of the Fed, although some reviewers of the book who specialize on criticism of the Fed I think ha have exaggerated a bit how critical I really am. They haven't exaggerated how critical I am of the uh, ECB. I think it's quite remarkable with hindsight to recall that the European Central Bank concluded already in 2010 that its work was done and began to phase out its initial unconventional monetary policies. And even worse, the ECB raised interest rates twice, I remind you, uh, already in, um, in 2011. What lessons of history uh, informed this extraordinary turn, turn of uh, events? Central banks institutionally possess a deeply ingrained fear of inflation. We know that fear is nowhere deeper than in Germany, given the history of the hyperinflation. We know that German fear translates directly or translated directly into European policy, given the Bundesbank-like structure of the European Central Bank um, in, in, in uh, particular. In the case of fiscal, in, 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 with regard to fiscal policy, I would argue that uh, the case for con continued stimulus uh, 
or more stimulus was weakened by its failure to deliver everything promised, whether because politicians are temperamentally prone to overpromising, or because the economy was in fact contracting faster than we appreciated in late 2008, early 2009, given uh, the inaccuracy inac uh, of real-time data. So that's uh, uh, another respect in which I'm inclined now to look back at the Great Depression differently. If you look back at what uh, the newspapers were writing in late 1929 about after the Great Crash, about the Christmas shopping season, they were broadly positive. Uh, contemporaries in the late 1920s had even less real-time data than our policymakers enjoyed. There was the failure to distinguish how bad conditions were from how much worse they would have been without the policy. There was the failure to distinguish the need for medium-term fiscal consolidation from the uh, need for pu more public spending in the short term. There was the failure to distinguish the case for consol consolidation in countries that needed it, like Greece, from the situation in countries with fiscal space, with room to do more, like Germany. So, as in many such cases, a range of factors came together. The one thing they had in common was failure. Inevitably, uh, failures like these have multiple causes. There was the dominance uh, of ideology and politics over economic reasoning. There was the inability of economists, my third and last mea culpa, if you will, to make the case effectively for better policies. There was the tendency of the economics profession to forget as many lessons of, of the 1930s as we remembered. Having said all that, I would argue that however, that the most powerful factor in this premature decision to abandon policies that would have done more to support the economy when the economy still needed support was surely that policymakers had prevented the worst. They had avoided successfully another Great Depression. They could declare the emergency over. They could, therefore, heed the call for an early return to normal policy. So the irony is their very success in preventing a 1930s-like economic collapse led to their failure to support a more vigorous recovery. So the argument of the book is that we won the battle, but we lost the war, that there is a, a, a sense in which uh, success was the mother of failure. So this is not to be brutally clear. I, having talked about uh, this a few times before, I feel the need to be brutally clear. This is not an argument that we should have let the big banks fail in 2008. This is not the argument that we should have let the unemployment rate rise to 20% rather than 10%. But it is an argument that there were unintended consequences of the policy decisions that we took in the midst of the financial crisis. Everybody talks about the moral hazard that resulted or the inducement to risk taking that resulted from bailouts. But there were other consequences, side effects uh, as well that I think we need to remi remind ourselves of. Um, I would make the same argument about financial reform. In the 1930s, we got far reaching financial reform. We got the Glass-Steagall Act, which uh, um, placed a very high wall between um, risky investment banking and, and low-risk commercial banking. We got federal deposit insurance in the United States for the first time. We got the creation of a Securities and Exchange Commission, which provided government oversight, federal government oversight of stock and bond markets in the United States for the very first time. So this was far-reaching financial reform, and the explanation for it is that the prevailing regime was discredited. The banking and financial system collapsed. The banking lobby was disenfranchised, if you will. This time we saved the banks, which my, my view of the situation and my, my view of history suggests was the right thing to do from an economic, political, and, and, and social point of view. But there were 
consequences. The big banks survived. Uh, the banking lobby was allowed to regroup, and it was able to, to push back against more far-reaching financial reforms. So say what you will about the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, but it's weak soup compared to the financial reforms uh, that we put in place in the 1930s. And I would argue the same is true of the Vickers Rule and financial reform in the UK and, and uh, 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 the reforms in which the Europeans have embarked. So again, the, uh, the, the point is that we won the battle, we prevented the financial system from collapsing, but we lost the war in the, in the sense that we haven't been able to put in place the kind of measures that can reassure us that the same bad things won't happen uh, again. Knowing uh, the audience, this is the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and uh, the, the events that we're now reading about uh, in the newspapers at the moment, uh, I should say a few words about Europe and the Euro before I um, conclude. Um, I think with, with hindsight, hindsight is always 2020, we, we can say that the decision to create the Euro in 1999 was one of the great economic blunders of, uh, of the 20th century, un, un, unlike uh, Queen Elizabeth's visit to the LSE in 2008, I, I, I think uh, a lot of people did see this uh, problem uh, coming and did understand that monetary union without banking union, fiscal union, and political union will not work, that Europe has to move further in the direction of creating a, uh, a, a real banking union a semblance of a fiscal union and something beginning to resemble uh, a political union in, in order to make uh, uh, the, the, the euro a, a workable system. Here again, in trying to understand what the future holds for Europe, lots of people refer to the analogy with the Great Depression, and in particular, the, the analogy between the gold standard system of the 1930s and the euro system of today. Just as the gold standard then prevented national governments and central banks from responding in stabilizing ways, the euro system poses similar obstacles uh, today. Uh, that earlier tension was resolved by individual countries abandoning the gold standard, regaining their policy autonomy, putting in place stabilizing policies, and that has led many observers to predict repeatedly over the course of the last five years that this crisis will be resolved as well by a country, um, call it Greece, or a group of, uh, of European countries abandoning the euro. So far, uh, this hasn't been the case, and I would argue that that analogy is a misreading of history that the current situation in Europe is fundamentally different from the situation in Europe under the gold standard in the 1930s. In the 1930s, when governments abandoned the gold standard, international transactions had already effectively collapsed. International trade and, and international financial tra transactions had already uh, evaporated. This time, Europe still has a single market to uh, protect and defend, and it's a real question of whether the single market would survive the collapse of the euro, whether the European Union, for that matter, would survive uh, the collapse uh, 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 of the euro. Notwithstanding the strains of this crisis, political solidarity in Europe is still today considerably higher than it was in the 1930s. I remind you that in 1931, when that earlier crisis reached its peak in Europe, uh, the countries concerned were only 12 years removed from trench warfare, from the, uh, uh, the conflicts of um, World War I. This time around, uh, Europe has much stronger collective institutions than it had earlier when it had a, 
dysfunctional League of Nations and, and when it had just created the Bank for International Settlements as a bank for transferring reparations from Germany to France, which made it useless from the point of view of organizing international cooperation. So I think the situation in Europe is different than uh, the situation was in the 1930s. I continue to hope against hope that uh, the Euro system will survive. Where that earlier crisis led to the collapse of the gold standard, this one hasn't led yet to the collapse, hasn't yet, hasn't led to the collapse of the Eurozone at least yet. So on that happy note, I'm, uh, <laughs> let me conclude. I'm, I would be pleased to take um, questions, comments, objections from the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Eichengreen. Now we'd like to go out to the audience. If you could raise your arm and wait for a mic, and we prefer questions to comments here generally, but <laughs> right here, please, in the fourth row, Sheldon Marcus. Thank you. Um, could you tell us what reforms that you consider to be the most important that have yet to be done? What, what's your recommendation for moving forward in the way of reforming the economy? Well, starting with reforming the financial system, I think I would focus on three elements. Number one, more robustly capitalizing the banking system, requiring the banks to hold, have more skin in the game, a larger cushion against shocks. I, d I don't think that our big banks are going to be broken up. I don't think Europe's big banks are going to be broken up. So. Um, if they're going to remain too big to fail, we have to make them too safe to fail. And more capital would be a starting point for that. Number two, don't focus too much on the banks. I think there is always a temptation to do that. Banks have a face where the rest of the financial system, the so-called shadow banking system, tends to be a bit more anonymous and to fly under the radar screen to Often, So I think the problem in derivatives and securitization markets that contributed mightily to the 2007-2008 crisis, many of them are still out there. So I would like to see derivatives transactions not simply moved into clearing houses uh, where counterparty risk can be concentrated rather than eliminated, but moved onto electronic platforms, onto exchanges. And if someone in, in the room or another room objects that some derivatives are too complicated, too opaque, too exotic, too thinly traded to move, be moved on onto an exchange, I think that's a ar good argument for why they shouldn't exist. And third, I think there is still a problem that uh, the rating agencies conflict of interest that they are, to which they are subject because they both advise securitizers on how to get a AAA rating and then they confer the AAA rating. That problem has been ameliorated but not removed. The issue that the rating agencies are still relied on uh, by regulators has similarly been ameliorated but not removed. It should, ideally, it would be removed entirely. Thanks. Yeah, next question up the front here. Phil Levy, please. Thank you. I understood you to argue that uh, the Europeans were inadequate in their monetary policy, the U.S. was inadequate in its fiscal policy response. My question is, to what extent was the information to draw that judgment available in real time? And if it's not available in real time, given that there's potentially a cost to overreaction, how does one, what kind of lessons does one draw? There, there was an issue of um, data availability. I, I think um, both, both in the late 1920s and now, but I would argue even on the basis of, uh, of the data that was available to us uh, at the time, uh, there was uh, uh, 
a, a desire not to overreach and a, and a tendency to err in the direction of, of doing too little rather than uh, too much. I think that was true of fiscal policy in the United States. It was true of fiscal policy in Europe. Although in Europe, the case for fiscal stimulus is more, has to be more nuanced. And part of the European problem was lack of nuance that everybody engaged in fiscal stimulus in Europe starting in 2009, where the reality was only some more lightly indebted European governments were really in a position where that was safe. In, 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 in the case of monetary policy, I think my view would again be that both the Fed and the ECB erred in, in, in the direction of caution. So that sounds like an extraordinary statement given the unprecedented, unconventional policies to which each central bank ultimately turned. But I remind, remind you that it took the Fed three tries, QEs one, two, and three, before it finally made the kind of open-ended commitment that did succeed in vanquishing the ghost of deflation. And it took the European Central Bank five years to get there. So I think in my own view in terms of the balance of, of risks is that we collectively erred significantly in one direction, even given what we knew at the time. So you can, you can accuse me and, and you wouldn't be entirely off base of writing history through the rear view mirror. Uh, those of us who write this history have to try to resist that tendency. Thanks. Uh, the gentleman please in the third row from the back. What's the opportunity cost in terms of the weak recovery from not having any pro-growth policies, only monetary policies to address the crisis, such as tax reform, lowering tax rates, broadening the tax base, uh, uh, new trade agreements promoting international trade, a means test or a, a high bar for regulatory initiatives. What's the opportunity cost from a lack of those private sector initiatives to address the crisis? I think all those um, public and private sector initiatives to try to invigorate the supply side of the economy are valuable, they're critically important. They're not the issue in the midst of a crisis where uh, demand and spending are collapsing. So this is the big mistake that the Europeans have made to focus on the supply side in a period where the demand side is the problem and quite frankly to overload the political agenda. So why has the situation in Greece turned into such a disaster? Partly because the agenda for the previous governments there was so overloaded that no government could conceivably marshal uh, effective public support for the policies that they were asked by the Troika, you know, by their external paymasters to put in place. Um, um, here I am in Chicago where a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, but I think the problem in the crisis was this tendency to confuse um, the, the, the need to focus on, on, on the demand side in the short run and then to, to refocus on the supply side, which is, I agree with your implication, what we should be doing now. We have a student group here from Northwestern. Do any of the students have a question? Okay. Yeah? Oh. Uh, I was actually wondering how you thought the, uh, the ratings conflict of interest could be uh, resolved, like if there could be some sort of uh, separated government rating agencies with a kind of, kind of a separated role like the Federal Reserve that additionally uh, rates uh, investments um, like private ratings companies do, or, or, or if there could be additional regulation of private ratings companies, how do you think uh, we could go about resolving that? Well, I, th I, I, I think there is a role for um, private sector rating agencies. They are, they are part of the information infrastructure that gives uh, in, in, in investors and, and, and markets the 
data and analysis they need to make informed decisions and ultimately we have to rely in large parts uh, on those markets for, for resource allocation. But I think um, uh, if rating agencies are, are going to uh, undertake that information function for the markets, then they, then they should limit themselves and if they won't be limited by the regulators to focusing on that and not engaging in this advising business for the same customers at the same time. So um, it is the case that uh, uh, at least one and, and probably more new uh, startups in the rating, rating agency space have come along to focus on that information provision. We, we provide ratings and, and, and that's what we focus on uh, to the markets. That in turn raises an issue of what their business model is going to be. Where are they going to make money in terms of, of providing these ratings? Uh, I think there is a problem that the incumbents have had a special status uh, conferred by uh, the regulators because they're, if they have that special status, the regulators can turn around and use their ratings for, um, for purposes of, of judging the capital adequacy of financial institutions. But here's an area where I, where I think more competition actually, you know, is, gets you a good ways toward the solution. And if there are, are conflicts of interest, they need to be, that, that's why we have regulators fundamentally to address them. Thanks, yeah. Um, oh, why don't we do right up here, Dave Johnson in the third row, please. Yeah, thank you for, for your very interesting talk. I want to ask you about income inequality. Uh, Gilded Age, obviously, one of the greatest periods of in income inequality in our history, and we're starting to match it again today. A difference is coming out of the Great Depression, income inequality narrowed. Coming out of the Great Recession, it's continued to widen. Should we read anything into that? Well, it took some time after, uh, after the Depression itself for, for, for the United States and, and other countries to move into the period that is sometimes called the Great Compression, where income inequality was compressed after uh, World War II. We had a, a remarkable quarter century in, in the United States, in the advanced countries as a whole, um, in terms of being able to create good jobs, not only create economic growth, but, cr but create good jobs, um, something that we haven't been successful so far in, 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 in this recovery clearly in doing. So um, the, the growth of inequality has deep roots. It goes back in the United States uh, a, a long way depending on how you read the data for several decades prior to the financial crisis. It reflects changes in technology, it, it reflects globalization, it reflects the inefficiencies of my own industry, education, to do a better job at, at, at conveying the skills and training, the numeracy and literacy that, that people really need um, in the 21st century. So it took us decades to create this inequality problem and it'll probably take us a while to um, to address it as well. So um, I think that is one of the interesting developments now in this recovery, in the, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, that we didn't have any discussion of the inequality problem until a couple of years ago. So I think Mr. Piketty and his book certainly came along at the right time, and helped to galvanize a discussion that we were finally ready to have already and hopefully that discussion will, will lead to more thinking and then some action on um, what we do in terms of uh, education, training, in, a, a, and the like. Thanks. Yeah. Next question. The gentleman right there, please, that's next to you. Thanks. Uh, you spoke of the goal of uh, returning to pre-crisis uh, financial normalcy. Um, do you think one of the conditions then that uh, caused the, the crisis in part was the government subsidization of mortgage um, 
through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac artificially keeping mortgage rates low as well as uh, mortgage deductions on taxes and other mortgage policies. Do you think something needs to be done to address the um, artificial incentives of keeping uh, mortgage rates low? Well, I think we have a variety of policies, tax policies in the United States that encourage debt more broadly. So I'm, I, I'm focusing on the economy as a whole as opposed to the mortgage market. I have a few pages in the book that push back against the view that it was that Fannie and Freddie, that the uh, Clinton and then Bush administration's affordable housing goals were fundamentally responsible for, for the crisis. Uh, I, I, I think there is an argument there. I would put them low, relatively low on the list, uh, on my personal list of culprits, where I would put um, half-baked financial deregulation at the top. I would probably put uh, a monetary policy that was too loose for our own good between 2003 and 2006. Next on the list, I would put the large inflow of foreign funds into the United States, which fueled uh, all these excesses, the Bernanke savings glut and the money coming from China. Next on, on the list, and maybe there's a role in my view for Fannie and Freddie after that. If you look at the data on who, who was buying these toxic derivative securities in the 21st century, the answer is um, in, in increasingly a variety of private sector entities and not Fannie and Freddie, certainly uh, after 2003 or so when their share of subprime, their, their holdings of subprime securitizations go down as a share of the total outstanding. So one can make an argument about how, how they played a contributing role. Uh, I, I would make the case against overstating uh, their contribution to the problem. Thanks. The gentleman right behind, please, there. Is the inflation and the uh, overspending of the 1970s still dominating the thinking of many economists and central bankers? Well, certainly I think the, uh, um, the 1970s in, in, in inflation was a powerful factor in, in, in the change in central banking priorities, frameworks, outlooks that followed. So uh, the adoption of the in inflation targeting framework that central banks followed in the 1990s after the turn of the century, a framework that I now think is being modified in important ways to uh, in in incorporate the uh, importance of other goals like financial stability was in, in, in fact importantly shaped by the experience of the 1970s. The 1970s was a decade when inflation was public enemy number one. So it followed that the way central banks went about their business in the decades that followed was powerfully shaped by that experience. Uh, the gentleman, please, in the Navy blazer. Andy, right there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, n now that the Fed has done its job, and fiscal policy has certainly not supported it, but the Fed is stuck with a balance sheet of four and a half trillion uh, of assets. At this point, how are they going to unwind, in your opinion, and what should be the start? It's not an interest rate problem that the Fed seems to have. It's really a reserve problem, as I see it. But what would your response be? My, my response would be the Fed should unwind it, it, its large portfolio slowly. Um, there's no reason that it has to be shrunk anytime soon back to, um, to pre-crisis levels. The Fed doesn't have to sell its holdings of mortgage-backed securities or treasuries into the market. It can let them mature over time, over the next five years and roll off its balance sheet if that's appropriate given 
uh, the development uh, of the U.S. economy. Um, I found myself embroiled as a result of something I wrote for uh, Project Syndicate about a month ago with, uh, uh, in, in a debate in Switzerland over this very question. So I am now persona non grata in Switzerland because I criticized the decision of the Swiss National Bank, their central bank, to uh, abandon uh, their exchange rate target. They abandoned it because they were concerned about the size of their balance sheet. Um, the Swiss franc appreciated by 20% on one day. Uh, deflation returned. Switzerland was pushed to the verge uh, uh, of another recession. My view is that the mandate of the central bank, you know, it, it varies by central bank. Ours has a dual mandate uh, about price stability and, and high unemployment, not about the size of its balance sheet. Am I missing a woman who's got her arm up, please? Because I can't. Oh, yes, there's one right there. <laughs> right there, please. You seem to be in an interesting spot to see a lot of what's happening in your profession um, at graduate student level and around the world. My question to you is, what is the level of ferment? Are freshwater and saltwater economists just going to their battle stations? Are there gigantic lacunae that have been exposed that, that you're dying to get your research around, anything like that? Give me a sense of what's what's happened in, in your profession as a result of all of this? I think freshwater and saltwater uh, economists are re retreating to their balance, to, to, to their battle stations. Um, I think many of us, you know, who have been in this profession for a while are uh, too set in our ways to change our stripes. Uh, and even the worst financial crisis in 80 years won't fundamentally change the way we go about our scholarship, our advising, our business. The way the profession changes is because the students who are being trained now have, have a different view and, and go about their research differently. So my perception, um, you will understand that Berkeley and Cambridge UK are totally representative from, <laughs> from this point of view, is that uh, uh, students notice the financial crisis and the kind of topics that they're interested in have been affected by that experience. That um, students are, are, are more receptive, more sympathetic to uh, historical material. So both the great joy and the great bane of my existence at, at, at Berkeley is that the economics department has a required first year course for PhD students in economic history. So I have a captive audience, which you know, is a really good thing to put across my messages about the value of economic history, but there, there are always lots of students in there who, who don't want to be there because they had been engineering majors as undergraduates and they didn't go to graduate school to be exposed to economic history. They are more sympathetic more of them are tolerably sympathetic to historical evidence and analysis than was the case before the crisis. Finally, I, I, I think I would argue that big data make a difference, that big data have an impact on economic uh, research, just like, like uh, they do on, on research in other fields, what I'm impressed by is that economics is becoming a more fundamentally empirical discipline where once upon a time people who did do pure theory were the high prestige people who held the academic high ground. I think now people who do serious empirical work, which we can do in economics in a way that we couldn't when I was in graduate school because big data are out there. Graduate students know how to harvest data from online sources in a way that their predecessors didn't, and we have the computing power to analyze it as well. Economic analysis is now more responsive to what is going on in the real world for that reason as well. Um, so I am on balance 
hopeful that we're moving in positive directions. So I'm just not hopeful that it'll happen anytime soon. It, it will take time to repopulate the profession. That's how these things work. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. But Professor Eichengreen will be signing his book outside. I'm sure there are lots of answers in there. And thanks a million to Zurich for their support. Thank you.